the keys to theosophy. She lists three main goals of theosophy. Firstly, the universal brotherhood of humanity without distinction of race, color or creed. Secondly, to promote the study of the world's religions. And thirdly, to investigate the hidden mysteries of nature. Theosophy is the first major New Age group and they are largely responsible for many of the New Age beliefs, including the belief that Jesus represented the Sun God. The global elite are New Age occultists who adhere to New Age dogma and are responsible for this trend of discrediting Christianity, Jesus Christ and Christian New World Order researchers. This trend is a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that is coming into fruition at the end of this age. The occult community is full of secret societies that practice secret oaths, secret meetings and secret occult practices. This implies that they have something to hide. The Bible says that what is done in secret will be brought into the light. God does not keep secrets but has revealed truth to us in the Bible. At the heart of all occult teachings is pride that their secrets are only for the select few. It caters for an elitist mindset. At the heart of all they teach and do is the attempt to discredit the true God, the deity of Jesus Christ, the Bible and Christians in general. Now in Ephesians 6 verse 12, the Bible reveals that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So we can see that uh, this is part of a spiritual battle. It's not people that we're fighting against. These ideas and ideologies and so-called spiritual principles come out of the demonic realm. These are spirit beings that are peering to these occultists and seeding their lies into their writings, into their minds, into their spirits. And of course, these doctrines of demons are then taught as so-called truths or spiritual revelation. Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from York Juggler 66, Hour of the Truth. Today we have a Monday evening, in my time here at least, and over there in the United States of America where I'm connected with, um, uh, via Skype with brother Daryl Eberhardt. It is just a little bit after lunchtime. It's about, I think, uh, 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And um, we have spoken, uh, we have no, we, we have made an appointment today to come together to do another reading of the wonderful paper from Richard Bennett. Um, that of course I always forget the title of, uh, The Heritage of the Reformation for the Present Time. I think this is about the fourth reading we are going to start today. Over here we are getting <coughs> a little bit spring weather, and I learned from Daryl that he even had to shovel snow, even though it is very hard for him because of his uh, physical condition. So I very warmly welcome Brother Daryl to the broadcast today for the reading of the paper of Richard Bennett. Hello Daryl, and uh, as I said, welcome. How are you? And uh, good. it's good afternoon from here to you, and, and I'm doing okay, as, as you learned from me earlier, and even though I was out shoveling snow, which we seem to get a lot here in my little mountain, uh, which I'm not too far away from the very top of the mountain, and that's why we get a fair amount of snow and rain. When it doesn't snow, it rains, so we don't get a whole lot of sunshine. But anyway, it's good to be here. It's good to be talking about the Reformation, and I just uh, put in an order for a bunch of videos. Uh, I have videos on uh, Jan Hus and uh, uh, William Tyndale and Martin Luther. I have the old black and white but they had a special at this um, play, a place that I just found out about. I just uh, called them this morning, and I ordered a special Reformation packet that they had. And uh, they're, they're, I think it includes six or seven different videos. Now, three of them I already have, but I can't find the one. So it's, it's always good to have an extra copy. So I'm glad that uh, we've got some people that carry information about the Reformation. Of course, uh, Richard Bennett, uh, whose paper you're reading today, uh, Berean Beacon, and I urge everybody to go up to bereanbeacon.org and check out the audios and the videos. I just told Jerk that they changed the video and the audio on their homepage. It seems like every two to four days they 
put a new uh, a new a different one up. I shouldn't say new. Most of them are some of them are very, fairly old, but some of them are within the last two years. And uh, of course, Richard Bennett uh, is a uh, former Dominican priest of 22 years. Um, I count him as a not only as a Christian brother but a friend. And uh, I've known Richard for years from the time that he was down in Delval, Texas, till when he was up in Washington State, and he's in Michigan now, and he's semi-retired, but he's still uh, putting out some very good uh, videos and audios, and uh, he's done it so recently with uh, Pastor Bill Mencaro, who happens to be a, an expert on the Vatican. So I urge people, if you can go up and Check out Richard Bennett's Berean Beacon dot org and it's Berean B E R E A N like the Bereans in the Bible Beacon dot org and check out uh, the videos and audios that they have up there. So thank you, Yerk, for letting me pass that on to the listeners because uh, I think the world of Richard Bennett. He's getting fairly old now. He's he's at least eighty, and we should count those people very special in our lives uh, that they're still around and still standing for truth. Amen? Amen to that, yeah. Okay, so then we're going to go into the reading now from Richard Bennett's paper. And uh, we have to continue here on the bottom of page 9. And we are still in the sub-chapter um, um, that, is, um, that is called The Heritage of the Reformation Reminded Us of Salvation by Grace Alone. That is the name of the subchapter, and we are almost at the end of that, so I'm going to repeat this little sentence, and then we go into something that I prepared for. The author says, In the New Testament, there is an absolute connection between the Spirit and the Word of God, but not between physical water and grace. Thus, the Lord Jesus Christ said, quote, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit, and they are life. Unquote. Coming to new birth in the New Testament is by the Holy Spirit through the instrument of God's word. Thus, the Apostle Peter proclaims, quote, Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Unquote. I think this is taken from the book of Acts. Let's see, it's footnote 33. and uh, No, it's First Peter 1.23 that that is taken from. And he continues to say, Consistently and absolutely, in the teaching of Christ Jesus and the apostles, sinful people receive the Spirit simply by the hearing of faith. And here I put a little footnote in, because... This led me last time when I was preparing this, and uh, we, we just ran out of time at the end, um, of one of the most wonderful places, uh, in my opinion, in the book of Acts, uh, Acts chapter 8. And in Acts chapter 8, we read about Philip, who is going to um, not proselytize, but uh, telling someone about the wonderful deeds of Jesus Christ. And um, therefore, let's just open our Bible here. This is, of course, copied out of the 1611 King James Bible, the book of Acts, chapter 8, verse 26 and following, where the Bible says, quote, And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise, and go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went, and, behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch, of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure and had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot and read Isaiah the prophet. Now when the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and joy thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And the eunuch replied, How can I, except some man, should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. Now the place of the scripture which he read was this, He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his sharer, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation his judgment was taken away, and who shall declare his generation? For 
the his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speakest the prophet this? And of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Philip said, If thou believest with all thy heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way, rejoicing. I cannot think of a better example than that of chapter 8 of the book of Acts that I just read to you, that confirms what is written here in this paper, when we read, consistently and absolutely in the teaching of Christ Jesus and the apostles, sinful people, because the eunuch was a sinful man, as we all are, but even then he was a Gentile, sinful people receive the Spirit simply by hearing of faith. So he heard Philip preaching to him Jesus Christ, and he believed. What do you think of this example, Daryl? Do you agree with me there? Yes, 100%. And I mean, the book of Acts is a tremendous book, as as you know, and a lot of good things can be found in the book of Acts. So I'd encourage everyone to uh, uh, not only read their Bibles, not just the New Testament, but also the Old Testament. But the book of Acts is very, very good and uh, has some very, very good examples of of men of courage taking very strong stands. So go ahead. That's a, a tremendous book, the book of Acts. Yeah, and by the way, for the moment, I am uh, studying the book of Acts together with my German brother Michael and uh, brother Brett Norman. And uh, we will publish all these Bible studies of the book of Acts uh, probably sometime along this. So keep an eye on uh, Brother Brett's channel and uh, my channel, Juggler66, that you don't miss any of those videos that will eventually come out there. At least at one of my channels. I cannot uh, cannot promise that they will come out on my main channel. But, you know, I have more than one channel. And when you go to the description box of this video, for example, you will find a link to all the playlists of all my channels. And there you will easily find the Bible study, the book of Acts, if you are looking for it. And otherwise, just write me in the comment section of this video. But now we're going to continue in the reading. What we document is just the top of the iceberg of what is now a massive movement inside Presbyterian Reformed cycles, circles and beyond of what is called the quote-unquote new perspective. This movement requires articles and even books to explain its many ramifications. This movement and the consistent position of new evangelicalism that people are free to decide, repent and believe in Jesus Christ demonstrates the need for the heritage of the Reformation that the sinner is saved by God's grace alone. It is necessary for us who are saved by God's grace alone to plead that even in our day and generation he might yet truly glorify himself in revival blessings by this very principle. Coming to the next subchapter that is called the heritage of the Reformation reaffirmed salvation through faith alone. Now for the reformers, the faith which, uh, by which a sinner believes unto salvation is God-given and sustained. They showed that the object of faith is clearly seen in Scripture as the person of Christ Jesus himself, as the Apostle stated, quote, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. And this is from the book of Acts, because this deals about, um, I think, Cornelius. This faith, they contended, is God-given, as declared by the Apostle Peter, quote, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Saviour, Jesus Christ, unquote. 
God-given faith comes by hearing the word of God. And hearing the word of God comes by reading the Bible, right? Right. So, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The Bible says in, uh, let's just see, 36, that is Romans chapter 10, verse 17. This principle of salvation through faith alone is so clear in Scripture that one would doubt that it could be twisted by any church. Oh, enter the Roman Catholic Church. <laughs> Nonetheless, the Roman Catholic Church completely changes the concept of faith. In her official teaching, in her catechism, she focuses on the Church as the one that first believes, as she states, quote, It is the Church that believes first, and so bears, nourishes, and sustains my faith. And this is taken from the Catechism, paragraph 168. And I will not always mention these footnotes, as you see them right here in the picture, but you can see that everything that Richard Bennett says in this article is documented. And he is whether citing the Bible, or he is citing articles, or he is even citing, like in this case, Vatican VA archive, the Vatican itself. And all links are here for you to control them, of course, as long as they are still in existence. With articles, sometimes when these works from Richard Bennett get into the years, some articles that he used from the Internet are not available anymore. But the Vatican Archive site on catechism will probably not disappear. And so you can check everything that Richard Bennett says here in this book and documents by this point that that is the truth. We are not speaking of conspiracy theories. We are really speaking of documented facts. And he names, names the sources. So you can always look those up. I think this is a very important point we have to make here and there. So I will not always go into these footnotes because, you know, when it is a Bible quote, you can look it up for yourself, because otherwise I'm just switching between footnote and this, and all the others are just the documented notes that he put in this document here. Jörg, can I say one thing very quickly? Oh, yeah, please. And that is Take Richard time, Bennett. <laughs> yeah, no, Richard Bennett is very good at giving you something straight out of the official Roman Catholic catechism, and he'll give you the exact number. It'll say, he'll say, like, look at 637 or something. He'll give you the exact number within the official Roman Catholic catechism where you can go to look up something to find out exactly what the Roman Catholic Church hierarchy says about a particular item. So I, that's a very good point, and thank you, Jörg, uh, for letting me t say that. Yeah, it's also another thing that is uh, important to mention about Richard Bennett is uh, that Richard Bennett is uh, not only able to speak Latin, um, he studied that, of course, as his position as a Roman Catholic priest that he was for 22 years, but he is also very understandable, very learned in the word of the Pope. He understands Pope speech, if we can call it like that. Yeah. So whenever the Pope... Um, publishes a new encyclical or a new bull or whatever, all these papers are very first published in Latin. Then afterwards they are translated into the other languages, but they are first put out in Latin, because that is the language of that church. And Richard Bennett then reads these original Latin encyclicals and bulls, and analyzes them and gives his analysis in his videos and in his newsletters. That's why it is interesting for you maybe to subscribe. So when you go to the website, bereanbeacon.org, there is a little place where you can sign up for a, web, for, a, for a newsletter. And then you will receive newsletters via email and even via written mail. Even I, over here in Belgium, receive once in a while a written newsletter. Uh, that he sends down from America, it doesn't cost me anything. He is taking all the charges. yeah. And by that, of course, you can support him also. I mean, I'm not, telling that you, I'm not saying that you have to give money to him or whatever, but do as the Spirit leads you to. But it is very important that we understand that Richard Bennett is an expert in Pope speech and that he is an expert in Latin and in understanding these papers. And um, for... In case that you 
didn't know in the very first broadcast of Hour of the Truth some years ago now, I think it was in 2015 or something that I started this, I did a broadcast with uh, Tom Fress from Inquisition Update as my guest. And we were analyzing uh, the paper, reading the paper that Richard Bennett used where he analyzed the joint declaration of justification. That paper with what the... Uh, Lutheran Worldwide Federation uh, capitulated before Rome and came back under the wings of Rome. They signed that treaty on the 31st of October 1999 and uh, made a treaty with the Roman Catholic Church or you could also say they made a contract with the devil to sell their soul to the devil. And he made a paper on that in which he explained the ramifications of that paper, of the joint doctrine of justification. And uh, Tom Fress and I read through that paper and analyzed that paper in three sessions of each more than an hour, an hour of the truth. You can find that very easily when you go to the playlist, hour of the truth to the oldest broadcasts. And there you can still find that and have a look at it. And then you will understand what I just explained. That is really a little bit what Rich, where Richard Bennett has his God-given spirit working in, that he can explain Pope speech to us into plain speech, that we will also understand that. Amen to that. Richard Bennett is, Richard Bennett really does his homework. He studies his subject and he like uh, Yerk has pointed out, he understands Pope speech. He understands the nuances, uh, how they can say one thing and mean something totally, using words that we Bible believers use, such as justification, sanctification, and that, but they have a totally different spin, if you would, on those words. They have a totally different meaning. And, uh, yeah, Richard is, is an expert at Pope speech. So go ahead, Jerk. That's a very good point. So, then the author continues to say she has the audacity, speaking of the Roman Catholic Church, to declare that faith comes through the Church because the Church is our mother. Quote, Salvation comes from God alone, but because we receive the life of faith through the Church, she is our mother." Unquote. The end result of the Catholic Church is that a person believes in Mother Church and not on the Lord Jesus Christ. Believing is an ecclesial act. The Church's faith precedes, engenders, supports and nourishes our faith. The Church is the mother of all believers no one can have God as Father who does not have the Church as Mother. This is a quote taken from um, the Vatican Archive. Um, let's just see, this is just one paragraph here. Let me just go there for a second. Uh, because I think this is also something that Pope Francis said when he was doing his speech, I think it was in 2015, on um, uh, in St. Peter's Square. Let me just look up if I have that bookmarked here. I'm not sure if I have that bookmarked here. That's the problem. I think it is in the Safari browser that I have that, and um, I don't find that very easily there. It is a speech that he held, I think, in the month of June 2015 on the um, uh, St. Peter's Square in Rome. Oh, I, I, I don't find that here. And um, there he used the exact same words. It's the same speech where he said um, that uh, Christians are not made in a factory and uh, having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ is a dangerous thing. From that very same moment, is, uh, from that, uh, there he also said, no one can have God as father who does not have the church as mother. And there you see uh, the Roman Catholic Trinity, father, mother, and son, right? <laughs> That's something that is absolutely unbiblical, but that is what they revere. 
No one can have God as father who does not have the church as mother, and therefore you cannot have the son, because it's only the son who saves. So that's the Roman Catholic Trinity here. Therefore, Richard Bennett continues to say in his paper, the position of the Catholic faithful is that they are compelled to submit to Holy Mother Church and accept her rule of faith. If the question is ever raised as to why this is so, the only reply is that it is true because Holy Mother Church says so. <laughs> so her words are um, how do you say that there's, there's a word for that? Her words are self-fulfilling. Uh, it, it's a, it's a quote-unquote self-fulfilling prophecy, you can call it, right? Right. It is only based on what the church says. Why is it so? Yeah, because the church said it. And of course, the church has a speaker. And the speaker of the church is the Pope. And the Pope is unfallible since Vatican Council of 1870, where the infallibility of the Pope was established in Roman Catholic canon law. So when the Pope, as the head of the Mother Church, speaks, it is absolutely true in their eyes. I mean, this is just ridiculous when you think about it. Because it says that they don't revere the scripture, they don't revere the Bible, they don't revere the word of God. No, it is the church who has the last authority. And as for that, of course, it is the king of the church, let's call him, the Antichrist, that has the ultimate authority. That's what they teach, and that is absolutely 180 degrees opposite to what the Bible teaches. So you only have to think, your, uh, you only have to ask yourself, dear Roman Catholic listener, who are you going to believe? A fallible man that puts himself upon a, on the top of a system that he calls the one and only true church, and you believe what he says, and you follow the standards and the authority and the conscience of that what he says is true, or are you going to believe the book that has been finished writing about 2,000 years ago, where God inspired holy men to pin down his word in a book that we call today the Bible, preferably the 1611 authorized version of the King James Bible. Just ask yourself that. Are you going to believe a fallible man? whom you know when you read the scripture, the scripture says we are all born in trespasses and sins, he too, or are you going to, believe, going to believe the word of God? That's a choice that you have to make. Any comment there, Daryl? No, I agree 100%. Nice. <laughs> Let me continue. Now, for the most part, evangelicals throughout the centuries maintained the principle of salvation through faith alone. However, new evangelicals have departed from the principle of salvation through faith alone to accommodate megachurches and seeker-friendly churches beginning in the early 1960s, yeah, just before Vatican Council II, the ecumenical movement, started. Since then, the vast majority of the evangelical world has changed beyond recognition. Ian Murray documents his, uh, this decline in his book Evangelicalism, Dis Divi Evangelicalism Divided, a record of crucial change in the years 1950 through 2000. The most drastic departure, however, from the principle of salvation through faith alone took place in the United States in 1994. At the end of March of that year, a group of 20 leading evangelicals and 20 leading Roman Catholics produced a document entitled Evangelicals and Catholics Together, the Christian Mission in the Third Millennium, or short ECT, Evangelicals and Catholics Together. Now, I'm going to copy this and open my browser and do a little search and see if we can get that paper right here. I didn't do that in preparation. It's time to do that right now. We can have a look at this. 
evangelicals and Catholics together. Here you see that is the paper, and this is a um, Wikipedia article about it. And just when we click on the picture here, uh, we just see, oops, we just see the picture, well, and then you can buy the book, of course. Uh, and Richard, uh, yeah, uh, Yerk, while you're doing that, um, yeah, I, I just want to mention one. real quick. Okay. There's uh, a, a tremendous book, and you know about it because you've read uh, parts of it, and that's All Roads Lead to Rome, question mark, the ecumenical movement by Michael D. Semlien. I, I read the complete book, yeah. Yeah, and in it's English a tremendous... And in German, by the way. <laughs> and then there's another good book exposing the ecumenical movement, and that's Billy Graham and His Friends by Dr. Kathy Burns, and they can get that through Chick Publications at chick.com. But there's, uh, we've had a few people like Wilson Ewan, who's passed away, he, a Canadian. He put out uh, quite a bit of materials exposing the ecumenical movement. But uh, All Roads Lead to Rome, as you pointed out, the ecumenical movement by Michael D. Simulan is an excellent, excellent book, and so is Billy Graham and his friends. So we do have some people out there that have exposed uh, this ecumenical movement. Go ahead, Yerk. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm just uh, looking for something else because when you mentioned Michael Desemlian and uh, his book, um, let me just see, I don't have that channel here, right? No. Um, and you mentioned that book, All Roads Lead to Rome. Um, I just want to tell the people that there is a. Where's the mind? Mind radio. There is a uh, another reading because I did re I, I did read the book um, uh, All Roads Lead to Rome by Michael the Semlian who works together with Richard Bennett on the website Berean Beacon. Yes. But uh, and let's just go to the playlists here. Uh, Tom Fress from Inquisition Update he read uh, the successive book Michael the Semlian wrote that is called The Foundations Under Attack. I'm just looking where I can find the playlist here to, to show you that. Um, but that's only the last few playlists he put here. Uh, favorite shows, featured playlists, maybe it's in here. You see, this is the channel of First Amendment Radio where Tom Fress has his um, daily program Inquisition Update running on. But yeah, we, we, we see a few playlists here of him, but I cannot find this right now. Maybe I just have to go to the search engine here. Uh, just looking for the word foundation. I think that is a book that he read in 2017. Yeah, Foundations Under Attack. You see, this is part one. So, uh, I don't know in how many parts he, he read that book, but it's uh, quite a few, I guess. Um, this was published on 21st February 2017, so he read that, uh, he read that in 2017. And um, he pointed out a, a very important blunder um, that Michael Desemlian did in that book. If you want to learn about that, just go to this here and, and read Foundations Under Attack by Tom Fress. Watch his videos, watch his uh, book reading there. Uh, that is the successive book of uh, All Roads Lead to Rome that Michael de Semlian wrote, I think, in the beginning of uh, of the 2000s. And he wrote that in 1993, Jörg. Oh, 1993, Foundations Under Attack, yeah? Okay. No, no, the other book, All Roads Lead to yeah, Rome, was written in 1993. Yeah, but the successive book, okay. Foundations Under Attack, I think that was from the beginning of the 2000s, if I'm not mistaken. Right, okay. I and, thought you said the other one here. No, 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 no. Um, and uh, Tom Fress read that whole book and explained that whole book, and he found a very, very, very big mistake in that book uh, that will probably even blow your mind. So when you're interested in find out what that is, well, then just go to this playlist here and look it up. And in the meantime, we have here this publication of uh, Evangelicals and Catholics Together Taught a Common Mission by Charles Colson and Richard John Neuhaus, uh, who are the editors of this book. And that is what we are just reading about. Evangelicals and Catholics together. Yeah, you see here, of course, um, who is that guy? Ah, oh, I know him. <laughs> no, it is not Billy Graham. It's, uh, who is that guy? 
most Chuck of the Colson? Time, no, most of the times the name is, is, is there. Um, but just right here, they don't put the name of this guy in here. Everybody knows him. He's, uh, uh, he's very famous, but um, I, I just can't come to his name. And why don't I see that on... Why don't they write that here under the picture? That is very strange. Anyway, uh, let's not uh, lo get lost in, 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 in this stuff. Um, evangelicals and Catholics together is, of course, uh, as you understand, a very diabolical um, uh, agenda that they follow. Evangelicals and Catholics together. That is nothing else but putting into practice what has been decided on the Second Vatican Council that ran between the end of 1962 until 1965, the Ecumenical Council. And interesting is, of course, that we read here that um, the most drastic departure, however, from the principle of salvation through faith alone took place in the United States in 1994. Now, in 1999, I told you the Worldwide Lutheran Federation signed the Joint Doctrine of Justification. Let's just see if I have a picture for you here of that. Justification. I think I must have a picture here and my computer on that. They signed that on the 31st of October in uh, 1999. Here is a picture of that document, JDDJ. Joint Doctrine of uh, on the Doctrine of Justification, and this other picture, this is taken from the Vatican website where you can read the whole document, Joint Declaration on the Doctrine of Justification by the Lutheran World Federation and the Catholic Church, starts with the preamble, and then you can go through that, um, you can look that up very easily on the internet, then we have here the Council of Trent Justification and Salvation, what does the Council of Trent say in that regard? Salvation through grace by faith. Without grace we are doomed, but we must cooperate with grace. Grace is only the beginning. Devotions and good works affirmed, but abuses like selling indulgences stopped. Faith and works. Seven sacraments. That is, in short, the conclusion of the Council of Trent. The Council of Trent decisions have never been revoked. They are still valid today. And uh, the Roman Catholic Church said, and that is something that you can learn when you study, uh, you probably remember that video from uh, Kenneth Copeland with uh, Tony Palmer, when he said the yes. protest is over. I made a video <clears throat> on that where I, uh, because at that time I didn't know how to record, uh, to make a video and use the original tone. I just uh, wrote down what Tony Palmer said and, and read it verbatim in my video, where he said that now the joint doctrine of the justification, the agreement was that we are saved through grace to good works. And that's what the Roman Catholics could agree with the Roman Catholic Church. But the problem is the definition of the word works. And the works is exactly that, what you see in this picture from the Council of Trent. It is still the seven sacraments. So the Roman Catholic Church did not change, but they used sophistry and casuistry to convince the Lutherans in that regard that they lay down their harness and ca re capitulate before the Roman Catholic Church and agree to the wording, we are saved by grace alone, through uh, two good works, not asking what are these works, and these works are still as defined in the Council of Trent, the seven sacraments. So, this picture, and then I have another picture, and that is this one, and this shows to you the signing of the Joint Doctrine of Justification. Bishop Dr. Christian Krause on the left side, he is the um, uh, Roman, uh, he is the Lutheran, and uh, the other one is Edward Idris Cardinal Cassidy. He sits on the right side, yeah? so that's that's him here. The Cardinal is the Roman, and the Bishop is the Lutheran, and they do sign this contract on the 31st of October, Reformation Day of all days to choose 1999. Now, as I said in this paper that we were speaking of here, um, 
it says that the drastic departure, however, from the principle of salvation through faith alone took place in the United States in 1994. So that was five years before 1999. And when we remember what Tony Palmer said in his video with Kenneth Copeland, he said, and five years later, the uh, Methodist Church also signed the same contract as the Lutherans did, the joint doctrine of justification, and they signed that when? Five years later. So you have 1994, 1999, and 2004. And you have the Roman Catholic Church making treaties here with the United States in 1994, with the Worldwide Lutheran uh, Federation in 1999, and with the Worldwide Methodist Federation in 2004. At the end of March of that year, 1994, here the author continues, a group of 20 leading evangelicals and 20 leading Roman Catholics produced a document entitled Evangelicals and Catholics Together, the Christian Mission in the Third Millennium, the paper we just spoke about. The effects of the compromise of this essential principle, well, the, the most important word here is the compromise. Uh, Daryl, I'm speaking so much. Why don't you take over for a few minutes and explain to our dear listeners what is the danger of that word compromise when you are speaking of doctrine and of the Bible? Well, the danger is, is that God doesn't compromise his word. The Holy Bible is 100% true. It's to be the, the foundation rock of our faith. And we can't depart from that one inch. And the idea of compromise, that sounds good if you're having a squabble with your neighbor over his or your chickens crossing over into the other yard and eating up some of his, his or your grain. That there can be a compromise there, but you can't compromise on God's Word. And that's what happened with the ecumenical movement. And I can say from an anecdotal side of uh, uh, part of this is that when I was in the uh, Methodist Church back in the, uh, oh, I'd say, 80s, when I came back um, from serving 20 years in the military, and I started going to that Methodist Church, they were lockstep with um, the World Council, well, first the National Council of Churches and the World Council of Churches, and that the compromising had already started big time. But it, uh, we also have the problem of uh, that has been brought out by these people like Dr. Kathy Burns and Michael D. Simlian and I think John Ankerberg and a few others wrote a book about ECT and ex and showed the the different people not just Billy Graham but Dr. Bill Bright there were, there were a lot of big names. Oh, Rick Warren. Uh, I'm sorry, Rick yeah. Warren was the name I was looking for when I was showing that picture earlier. <laughs> Rick Mr. Warren. Mega Church. Yeah, Mr. Mr. Mega, Mega Church. Church. I'm sorry to interrupt you, Daryl, but just when you when mentioning these names, Rick Warren popped up. I just had to shout that out. I'm sorry. <laughs> Please continue. No, that's okay. And I was just feel, I didn't know whether you had to take a break or not, so I was just telling them that how much I saw when I first got out of the military and came back uh, to this area in southwest central Pennsylvania, and I went to the Methodist Church for a couple years, and I just noticed the total compromise with joining the National Council of Churches. Well, they were already in it, but the World Council of Churches, and getting more and more and more ecumenically minded. And yeah, speaking, uh, speaking of the World Council of Churches, Daryl, isn't it interesting to mention to our listeners for once? Maybe you can explain that a little bit deeper. And by the way, I was listening all the time. <laughs> I'm just sitting here. Um, sure. Wouldn't it be interesting to explain to our listeners the Roman Catholic Church is not part of the World Council of Churches? How come? They don't need to be. They're the ones that are totally running the all of the ecumenical movement and everything from behind the scenes. And now it's it's more and more in your face where you see them out in the front. But even decades ago. There were many ministries on, on television, many of these televangelists. I, I think of uh, um, some of the different ones. Jack Van Impey started to go uh, much more uh, Roman Catholic-friendly compromising. Uh, there were Jan and Paul Crouch. 
there was always a priest in the background. And these were all considered new evangelical or whatever, uh, part of the, uh, of course, the Pentecostal charismatic movement. But they're all gateways into the Roman Catholic Church to get compromise rolling along and get people more and more, just like we saw with the Oxford movement that happened in England. We're getting a total replay in yeah, the United States and other places. Interesting the charismatics, because there you have Kenyan and the whole Kenyan connection people, you know, uh, starting the uh, charismatic movement at the end of the 19th century into the 20th century. And uh, Hagen, you know, Hagen Jr., Hagen Sr., uh, and they are preaching another gospel, of course. Eh? But I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I... No, no, and Kenneth Copeland, there's a bunch of big names in here. Benny Hinn. A bunch of these people, uh, all involved, well, many of them, of course, Oral Roberts uh, preceded them. Trefler where you Dollar. have, yep. Joel yep. Olstein and the father of Joel Olstein, by the way. Many people do not know that Joel Olstein is just the son. His father was very strong in the charismatic movement in the 1960s, 1970s. Yeah. So, yeah, these are all, all very, very good points, Jerk, and I'll let, let you go ahead and take over again there. <laughs> I'm just reading. Now, listen, the point that I wanted to make and that you already started to say uh, about um, why is there a World Council of Churches and the Roman Catholic Church is not in it? Well, the point is that if you want to understand why the Roman Catholic Church is not in it, I don't know if I have a picture of that. Let's just... Uh, check if I have this here from the Global Vatican. That is another book that Tom Fress read um, mm -hmm. in 2000 and I don't know 2017 or something. 99 parts, and you can look that up. No, I don't have an, uh, a picture here. Um, in the Global Vatican, it explains on page I think 206 or something about the special status of the United States of America and the United Nations, uh, of, of, sorry, of, 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 the, of the Vatican and the United Nations. They have an observer status. That observer status was initialized in 1964 by uh, then uh, chairman of the United, United Nations, the first one, I think it was, Hugh Tant, and he was only giving a paper... <laughs> <laughs> kind, kind like a you know little notepad paper. This uh, this yellow <laughs> yellow <laughs> notes you can <laughs> you you can plug everywhere. You know these little ones um, of the um, observer status the Vatican has over the United Nations. And George W. Bush in 2000, and if I'm not mistaken, four, and that is in the book, The Global Vatican, on page 206, you can read that, uh, produced an executive order recognizing the Vatican as a permanent observer to the United Nations and making that, per, that uh, uh, observer status to the United Nations permanent. So the Vatican has absolutely diplomatic immunity, is not part of the United Nations, but can take part in decision-making, but has only a guaranteed observer status. The Vatican is completely left out of the United Nations, like you can imagine, um, like when you see this picture of Jogla 66 and you have this clock, uh, Jogla 66 there is, uh, let's say, the Vatican, and that clock is the world, you, the United Nations. Well, the Vatican stands outside of that circle of the United Nations, as does that uh, writing of Jogla 66 stand out of the clock here. It is like they are outside of it, and by that they control it all. And that's the same with the worldwide, uh, with the uh, Council of Churches. This Council of Churches was founded for the same reason as the United Nations were founded. Now, understand me correctly, please. We are speaking of the spiritual power on the one hand and speaking of the temporal power on the other hand. The temporal power is the United Nations and the spiritual power is the World Council of Churches. 
and the Vatican is outside of both. The Vatican is outside of the United Nations and the Roman Catholic Church is outside of the World Council of Churches. But these institutions were founded to bring all the nations that are in there, or all the churches that are in there, when you speak of the spiritual, of the Council of Churches, and to bring them back under the wings of Rome. And that's why the Roman Catholic Church cannot be part of the World Council of Churches, and that's why the Vatican cannot be part of the United Nations, but has to have an outside observer status, as the Roman Catholic Church needs to have an outside observer status of the World Council of Churches, because all the attendants, all the members of the World Council of Churches, as all the members of the United Nations, have to gather together to come under the wings of Rome. And that's the point that I wanted to make and wanted to express to you together here with Daryl. Right, brother? Right. They're very sneaky. They love to not have themselves out in the front all the time. They like to d manipulate things from behind the scenes, especially with the Jesuits. That's and what then they they've gotten, yep, and now they've gotten more and more brazen with having uh, Pope Francis and other popes come to the United States and address the, the both houses or, uh, of Congress and that. Uh, uh, they very, very much are now showing that they're in control, even though they have been from behind the scenes for over a century, uh, more than a century, they're very, very much in control of things. And now it's, it's more and more in your face, like uh, you belong to us, United States of America, and we own you lock, stock, and barrel, and you will, you will uh, dance to our tune. And that's what's happening in today. And most countries in Europe are the same way as I'm sure Yerk will confirm yeah. that uh, v very few countries in Europe would, would dare to try to stand up uh, to papal Rome. Jesuit controlled papal Rome, I might add, yeah. that they don't have the courage. Go ahead, Yerk. Yeah, that's absolutely true, Daryl. I just wanted to make that point of to to you know, you know to, to, to get the listener to understand, to get the viewer of the video to understand that the World Council of Churches on the one hand as the spiritual and the United Nations on the other hand as the temporal are two organizations to lead all nations on the one hand in the United Nations or all churches on the other hand under the wings of Rome. Which, therefore, Rome cannot be a part of those organizations, but has to stand outside of them, because it is to Rome that all these churches in the spiritual way and all these nations in the temporal way have to go back to. And by that, giving the Vatican and the Roman Catholic Church the possibility to force a new world order, which is nothing else but the old world order, the time before the Reformation revived, when all the kings of the earth were dependent on the Pope of Rome. When, as in Revelation chapter 17, verse 2, let me just pick up my Bible here and open that up, because I really like to quote that uh, correctly from the Bible, verbatim, as it has to be said. In chapter 17 of the Bible, we read in verse 2, quote, With whom the kings... Okay, let's read verse 1. And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked to me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom, speaking of that great whore, the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. This is exactly the point. The whore is the Roman Catholic Church, and every other church has to go back under the wings of Rome, and every nation has to go under the wings of the Vatican. And that is exactly what this is speaking about. In the time before the Reformation, there was no king in Europe that ruled without the authority the Pope gave him. And the Pope got his authority from the dragon. And that is something that we read in uh, chapter 13 of Revelation. 
because it says in Revelation chapter 13, um, And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seed and great authority. And the dragon, as we read in Revelation chapter 12, verse 9, is, and the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So we understand that that devil gave that beast, which is built on many waters, with the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. So they are all adhering to Satan and not to the God of the Bible not to the Father in heaven and his only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, who came down to this earth, became man and became sin for us and died for us and washed us clean so we can stand righteous before the Father when we stand in Jesus Christ before him. And all these kings of the earth have committed fornication with that whore. They have all sold us out. They are not serving the country. They are actually have to serve. No American president ever served the American people. No German Bundeskanzler, Führer or whatever ever served the German people. They were all serving Rome. And Revelation chapter 17 verse 2 makes that clear. And in the days that we are living in today, now we are living in the very final stage that all these churches on the spiritual hand and all the nations in the temporal hand with the United Nations organization and with the World Council of Churches on the other hand come back under the wings of Rome and nullify everything and make naught everything that has been reached with the Protestant Reformation where the Protestants like Luther and Tyndale and Wycliffe and Mortimer and Latimer and Ridley, all these guys told the people through the Bible in the vulgar language that the Roman papacy is, was and always will be the Antichrist of the Bible. That teaching is brought to naught with this ecumenical movement. And that is exactly what we are speaking about here in this paper from Richard Bennett. Can you see how far this goes? I mean, this is only two little uh, paragraphs that we are reading, and especially this one paragraph here, the most drastic departure from the principle of salvation through faith alone took place in the United States in 1994. At the end of March of that year, a group of 20 leading evangelicals and 20 leading Roman Catholics produced a document entitled Evangelicals and Catholics Together. The effects of the compromise of this essential principle have changed many churches across the United States of America, but also across the United Kingdom and across the whole world. It has also thwarted evangelization in third world Catholic countries of Central and South America, in Africa, as well as in Spain, Portugal and the Philippines. If this movement to accept Catholicism and reject the principle of salvation through faith alone continues unchecked, it will become ruinous to the spiritual welfare of millions, and I say billions of souls, because that's where we are today in 2019. Right, Daryl? Right. There's there's over a billion, as and Yerk is very well aware of, there's over a billion Roman Catholics in the world. There's over a billion Muslims in the world. And right now, we're seeing uh, Islam come together pretty much with Papal Rome. And uh, they together have been the two greatest persecutors of Bible-believing Christians throughout the centuries. And now Go ahead, Yerk. Now, when you yeah. even add to what you just mentioned, the Roman Catholic Church on the one hand, and Islam on the other hand, and now when you go count the quote-unquote Protestants in this world, who are nothing but ecumenical evangelicals, who <laughs> have all signed the contract with Rome, like the Joint Doctrine of Justification, like ECT, Evangelicals and Catholics together, like the Methodist contract with the Roman Catholic Church, all these millions, hundreds of millions, quote-unquote, 
protestants who do not even know what they are protesting, when you count all them together, you have almost half of the world's population, right? For sure. And when you have half of the world's population with that, all that is left is Buddhism and Hinduism as the other major religions. Now, what do Buddhism, Hinduism, Roman Catholicism and Islam, or Mohammedism, as it should be righteously called, what do they all have together? What is their root? They all come from Babylon. And yep. that's what combines them together. You have very, very many rites, speaking of rituals, traditions, within the Roman Catholic Church that you can find in a little, just a very little adaptive way in Mohammedism, that you can find in Hinduism, and that you can find in Buddhism. The problem is they all have the same root. That's why they can easily come together. And when they all come together, they come together against Jesus Christ and against real Bible-believing Christians. That's the goal from the beginning because that is the war that was started in heaven as we just read in Revelation chapter 12. That war that started in heaven is a spiritual war that is continued here on the earth and we are the soldiers that have to fight these wars. But we don't have to fight these wars with uh, temporal meaning with um, knives and, uh, and swords of, um, of metal, material swords. We have to fight this fight spiritually because it is a spiritual fight. And therefore, I'm going to read to you for the end of this video, because we have to continue another time. Chapter 6 of the book of Ephesians. Finally, my brethren, it starts in verse 10, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, the wiles of the Roman Catholic Church, the wiles of the uh, worldwide, um, what's it called, um, Council of Churches. Yeah? We have to stand against these wiles because they are all the fiery darts of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your loins girded about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shot with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked." and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. One of the weapons that I just read to you was the... Where is it now? <laughs> I just read it. Uh, the shield of faith. The shield of faith. What did we just read to you? Faith comes by the hearing of the word of God, right? And you right. are saved through grace alone. And grace can only be imputed when you have faith. And therefore, faith is so important in that little paper we just read. Okay, it is a short video. We just have done about an hour, but I think I'm quite exhausted. <laughs> Took a lot out of me, and uh, it, it, it was a very important uh, little reading. We didn't read that many pages in the paper from Richard Bennett, but I hope that we made a point that you can come to the same conclusion that Daryl and I come, and I will, of course, leave Daryl the closing remarks of this video today. The World Council of Churches 
like the United Nations, is only an organization that is made to bind all the nations in the United Nations or all the churches in the World Council of Churches together, that they can hump on the train to go back to the station in Rome. And when they are all there gathered together, they have one thing in common. They all descend out of Babylon. And only the Bible explains you where Babylon comes from. They all have the same roots and then they will face one enemy. They will have no distinction between themselves anymore. They will have no fights between them anymore because, oh, let us not talk about the things that divide us. Let us only talk about the things that connect us, that we have in common, not anything that separates us. And when they have reached that state of mind, they will turn their face against the remnant of the Bible-believing Christians in this world. And then the persecution will start. For that Satan then can take his throne that he longed for so long ago. So long that we can read about it in the chapter of Luke, chapter 4. Let me just open this up. In Luke chapter 4 we read about the temptation of Jesus Christ. Yeah? And it says here, And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee. Yeah? Verse 5 in Luke chapter 4. And the devil, taking him up unto an high mountain, showed unto him, Jesus Christ, all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will, I give it. If thou therefore wilt worship me, and shall be, uh, all shall be thine. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And the Pope in Rome, who is the human mask behind Satan, behind which Satan hides, is the one who will bind all the nations and all the churches together and then in one final blow fight against the true church of Jesus Christ left in this world. That's the fight you have to prepare for with the whole armor of God as I read to you in Ephesians chapter 6 verses 10 through 18. Guard yourself. Take heed that no man deceive you. Read your Bible. Now, for the last words, Brother Tell. And I would say for my last words, and I think Eric is 100% in agreement with this, is the Bible, the Bible, the Bible. The Bible, the correct Bible, of course, is the most important thing in the world. And the Bible is made up of two parts. It's Old Testament and New Testament. We need to be studying in both parts and we need to be heeding what the Bible tells us to do. So I would encourage everyone to do as I'm trying to do, and I'm sure Yerk and uh, Brett and Tom do, and that is study the Bible and learn from God's Word. Again, it's the operating manual for the human soul. We wouldn't, again, operate, operate a, a million or a billion dollar, but a million dollar piece of equipment without reading the manual. And we shouldn't operate the human soul without reading the operating manual. And that's the Holy Bible. I want to close with one verse. Because unity sounds so nice. It's such a sweet word. And can't we just all get together and love each other? But uh, there's a, a verse, a command in the Bible, uh, in 18, Revelation 18, chapter 4. And here's what it says. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. That's a command for Bible-believing Christians to get the heck out of Dodge, as they say here in the United States. Uh, the time is to get out of that system if you're in it, because compromise will never work with that system. That system is 
total enslavement. And again, uh, thank you for having uh, me on with you, Yerk. Let me ride side saddle there or ride up on the stage, coach, riding shotgun with you. So thank you so much and God bless you. Now in Ephesians 6 verse 12, the Bible reveals that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So we can see that uh, this is part of a spiritual battle. It's not people that we're fighting against. These ideas and ideologies and so-called spiritual principles come out of the demonic realm. These are spirit beings that are peering to these occultists and seeding their lies into their writings, into their minds, into their spirits. And of course, these doctrines of demons are then taught as so-called truths or spiritual revelation. Quote, it will be fought largely with mental weapons and in the world of thought. It will involve also the emotional realm from the standpoint of idealistic fanaticism. This inherent fanaticism will fight against the appearance of the coming world religion and the spread of esotericism. It must not be forgotten that only those souls who are on the probationary path or the path of discipleship will form the nucleus of the coming world religion. There is no question, therefore, that the work to be done in familiarizing the general public with the nature of the mysteries is of paramount importance at this time. When the Great One comes with his disciples and initiates, we shall have the restoration of the mysteries and their exoteric presentation as a consequence of the first initiation. Now from these doctrines we can see that the stated objective of these occultists is to indoctrinate the public with their esoteric religious ideas and to externalize their occult teachings in humanity with the ultimate realization of a new world order that is devoid of what they call the negative influences of traditional Christianity. By this they mean that Christians who claim that salvation can be found through Jesus Christ alone and only through Christianity and that the Bible is the source of absolute truth, these people they say are divisive, narrow-minded, bigoted, fundamentalist, idealistic fanatics who are hindering the spiritual evolution of humanity. In other words, Christians are holding back the planet and retarding human progress on the planet. Here is a quote by Zygmunt Brzezinski. He says, The tectonic era involves the gradual appearance of a more controlled society. Such a society would be dominated by an elite unrestrained by traditional values. Soon it will be possible to assert almost continuous surveillance over every citizen and maintain up-to-date complete files containing even the most personal information about the citizen. Horus is one of the oldest and most significant deities in ancient Egyptian religion. Horus served many functions in the Egyptian pantheon, most notably being the god of the sun, war and protection. He is known as the god of vengeance, the god of the sky, protection and war. Now what many people don't realize is that America was founded by the Freemasons of Europe as a Masonic experiment. That's why, for example, uh, New York is named after the York Rites of Freemasonry in England, New York. And the Statue of Liberty, which was donated by the Freemasons of France to America, is in fact <laughs> A statue that signifies a spiritual evolution where man becomes God through spiritual enlightenment. This is why you have like these rays of the sun around the head of this goddess Columbia, uh, which is standing with this flame or the light. This all signifies that Lucifer, the light bearer, brings enlightenment to humanity.